Welcome back, everyone. Now, as we continue our journey into the world of Space Fighter, you're going to find our content becoming, let's just say, a little bit more sophisticated. We're now leaving the world of 101 or introductory content. Instead, we're going to start focusing on uh, more sophisticated topics. This video here is going to start a little mini series covering the topic of per pixel collision detection. Now, we have looked at collision detection in the past. Obviously, it's been important in most of the games we've written, but we've only used a couple of very simple approaches in order to determine if we had two colliding objects. The first one was the distance-based approach, where we had two objects, and with these two objects, we found their center points, and with those center points, we were able to calculate a distance between the two objects. We'll call that distance D. Okay, no, this is not a character turned sideways, such as Bart Simpson's. Now, we we're also able to calculate a radius for each of these objects. So let's call this radius A and radius B. If we were to take radius A and radius B and add them together, okay, and then compare that against D, the distance between the two objects, and we were able to find that D was less than these two guys combined together, then what happens? Well, we obviously had some sort of collision occur between the two objects because the only way to end up in a state like that is if we have something that looks like this. Right, Logan? That's right. Now the uh, the two radii combined are, in fact, shorter than the overall distance. That means we have some overlap. Exactly. So we use this several times. Another method that we talked about briefly was the rectangular intersection. So here we have two rectangles that are intersecting, so we obviously have a collision. Of course, these methods, while good and fast, do not give you that visual feedback of a true collision that you would get from per pixel collision detection. Right. The rectangular intersection method is very general. It's very inaccurate. That's right. The circular collision method was quite accurate, but only applicable to objects that were circular in nature. Exactly. So what if we had, here's a texture, and in the texture, uh, let me think of something to draw. I know, the most exciting shape in the world, an arrow. <laughs> we have an arrow. Now let's just say that all this area out here is completely transparent. So... In the game, what are you going to see? You're simply just going to see this floating arrow, right? Exactly. You'll have no indication as to what the texture bounds are because they're invisible. Exactly. So let's say that we have got a sphere that's just traveling around, and if the sphere comes in contact with the arrow, then we're going to have a collision occur. So if we used any of our other approaches that we've used in the past, that right there would be a collision, okay? That's not going to look right. It's going to be a sphere sitting out here when taken this graphic into account, and that right there is ding, 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 going to generate a collision? It doesn't look right. So at this point, we're going to have to start looking at the pixels to find out if the pixels are transparent or not and start working from that angle. So in this particular case, since this is all transparent, we know we don't yet have a collision. So as we move further in, further in, further in, the moment that we have opaque pixels colliding with opaque pixels, now we have a collision, and that would look far more accurate with the collision occurring like this with our object moving in that direction, okay, as I draw another arrow. There we go. So that right there is a collision. So this is what we need to take a look at. How do we go about doing this? Now, we're going to break this up into a few videos, and in this video, we're going to focus on dun, 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 pixel it's all about the pixel data extraction right because up until now we have been using the texture 2d data type extensively in storing uh, texture data and referencing it but we have not looked at how to read the individual pixel information how to extract the pixels from that texture so that we can look at them one by one and that's what we're going to do in this video what we're going to do is put together an application that's going to do the following we want to be able to take a texture and you're going to use something like a little 32 by 32 of one of the spaceships that are used in space. Exactly. Data, right? I've taken one of our um, our spaceship graphics and sized it down. I'll explain why I use such a small size once we get into the video. I'm just making up a quick graphic. There we go. So something like such. But then what you're going to do is read this pixel data in, and you're going to basically recreate it through 
kind of like an old style or old school ASCII drawing where you're going to represent each pixel at about, what, 12 times the size? Right. This whole video is more of a uh, proof of concept to show that we can, in fact, read individual pixel data and do something useful with it. The first thing that we'll do is simply prove that we have all the appropriate colors extracted by redrawing the graphic using actual alphanumeric characters to represent each individual pixel of the graphic. Is it starting to become clear what I'm doing? Does it if, make sense? I, just, I mean, it does in my head, but I just want to make sure. As I'm basically, well, so right if, now we've just drawn. If that's alpha numeric, hang on, we've drawn this area right here. Exactly. Now, <laughs> and just imagine you're using the letter O or the character zero to draw that. Yeah, or we find getting, some sort of cool character that we can use, and so draw on the other side just because I've got to. And oh, too hot. But aside from looking cool, what this will allow us to show is that we can in fact read. Um, pixel information because in the first the first time we set this out to draw we'll just reuse the colors found within the pixel itself so what we'll have is a giant scale version of the same graphic drawn with circles exactly there you go so that's now we have recreated that part of it i think we all get the idea but the nice thing is when logan goes through and has this actually created he's going to be able to put all of the color that was on the pixels here each pixel will be represented by its particular shade of color when it's drawn in the larger character style format here. And we'll also be able to carry that transparency over. Then once this is completely set up, Logan can then shift gears and say, all right, let's not focus on color and transparency. Let's just look at the alpha information. So then Logan can represent all of the actual alpha information in these pixels. And then we can see what is visible, what's not visible. Basically, we can set up a small filtration system. So a filtering system that will allow us to filter out pixels that are so transparent we wouldn't see them anyways in the game. So, I mean, right now, if we just collide it with anything that wasn't completely transparent, we could still potentially have collisions with our sprite that might look inaccurate to the player. Because there's still data there, but it's so, you know, when you're using Photoshop and it's anti-aliasing the, the lines and everything, it's so transparent that you can't see it. But in regards of a comparison in our program, it's going to say, all right, let's take a look at this pixel right here. And let's say that this pixel is part of the anti-aliasing on the outer edge. Exactly. So it's very, very faint. It would still register as a collision. So Logan's going to set up a filter in there to say, look, only show these pixels recreate this image if they are at least this much opaque and th and it, it really it's like cleaning up all the noise out of the graphic it's almost like making a virtual mask it's taking the yeah. alpha that's there and in place for drawing but reinterpreting it as a solid yes or no collision mask exactly. and then allowing you to filter that out so that way you can take the highly transparent pixels and simply exclude them from the mask so mm -hmm. we wouldn't consider them for collision so that is what is in store for this video here so, Logan, with that, let's go ahead and jump over to Visual Studio. And, of course, we are using XNA 2.0. All right. So, let's get this kicked off with a new project. We're going to make a new Windows game for XNA 2.0. And we can call this the project just uh, Pixel Data Extraction. And OK to create the project. From within the content subproject, I'll add a new folder, and we'll use this to store our textures. And while we're in here, I could go ahead and grab those textures. If we switch over to our working folder, we have two graphics, a ship graphic. And I could go ahead and just load this up really quick. So that's what our ship looks like. Now I have made a resized version of the ship that is very small, 32 by 32 pixels. And you'll see that when we do the uh, drawing using large dots, that actually results in either a 1,200 or 1,600% scale, depending on which size we so use. So it's quite huge. <laughs> so once we start working with the mask, I have included the small one just so we get an idea of what the entire ship looks like. Okay. So we can copy these graphics and go and look at our newly created project. Jump in here, and remembering that XNA 2.0 uses a content management sub-project, we'll jump in there where we will find our textures folder. Now one other thing I want to do while I'm creating assets is add a sprite font, since we're going to use that to draw the actual alphanumeric characters. And I'll add that as a new item to our content sub-project. Here we have sprite font, and I'm going to name this Tahoma right off the bat so that it will automatically pick up the Tahoma font. You also note that I didn't put the Tahoma sprite font within our textures folder like we had in the past. This is because I consider the uh, content management subproject enough of uh, an organizational level in its own right. 
So we'll close that up, and for the time being, I'll close out the sprite font. I'll leave everything else default in the font for the time being. Okay. All right, now that we have some assets to work with, let's add the necessary fields to our project in order to get these on the screen. Right below the sprite batch, we can add in a sprite font. And right there, we'll probably just call this field uh, font. Let's keep this simple since we only have one of them. Below that, we'll add in a texture 2D field called texture, and this will store the actual texture itself. It's, it'll be useful to refer to later if we want to draw it and be able to draw it as a comparison from the original texture to the interpretation that we draw with alphanumeric characters. And the last thing that I'm going to put in as a field is the field that should hold the pixel data information. I'm going to declare this field as a color array, which we will call pixels. And we'll see here shortly as we write uh, the next method that what we're going to actually do is copy the data out of the texture 2D itself and store it in a more individually accessible method, so in this case, make sure array. I, make sure I understand this right, because I'm playing the role of a student now. So as you go through this actual texture right here, there is a T in there, I promise. So as you go through this and you're going to pull out these pixels, you're going to store it as a color. So we're going to have R, G, B, and A. Exactly. And you're going to store that in an array. So here we are with an array. So you're going to have information, 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 and we're going to store an array of these colors. Now keep in mind that that array is a single dimensional array. That's right. Whereas the texture D has 2D or two dimensional information. Right. So we'll actually have to do a little bit of math, which should look quite familiar when we get to it. Sure. But, uh, I mean, we're still dealing with index 0, 1, 2, 3 inside our array. Right. But just to show on that, those pieces of data, you could label those things like R, G, B, and A right. for each individual piece. Just in case anybody was confused with my drawing. Exactly. So this is what you're doing. You're setting up for us to use a real texture that we're going to extract data from or get data from and then put into this array. Exactly. And we're going to store it in a color format using the color type. Right. That make, and just because the, the color format makes it very easy to access the individual components, the red, green, blue, and alpha components out of that texture. Okay. You can also extract that information into, I, I won't say any numeric inf, uh, data type, but in a general numeric data type, for example, you could pull the data out into an unsigned integer. As opposed and then, to, and you're talking about the RGBA, instead of putting it into a color type, we could have put it in an unsigned integer. Exactly. And in that point, you'd just have numbers for each element. Right. And you could still extract the component information. It would just be a little bit more mathematically complicated. Gotcha. The color type itself provides the functionality for getting the components separately. Okay. So, and, of course, we decided to go with the color type just to make it a lot easier to visualize what's going on here. Exactly. It's uh, It's... Um, the color, the surface type in the texture 2D itself is mapped out as color, and that means that the uh, pixels do align properly so that the color will interpret that data. It is worth noting that you do have to be careful if you start exploring different types that you can store the data in, mm -hmm. and that is you have to make sure that you know what you're looking at within the texture, as in the way the pixels are laid out. Here, with the way we're going to load the texture through the content management system, we will have the data, you could say, formatted in what the color type is expecting. That's why this works so well. If you start exploring your own types, you'll have to to take into account how the uh, information is laid out. Okay. But um, that, the color pixels array, is what we'll use to gain individual access. So from here, we can move on. And the next thing that I want to do is drop in the skeleton for, um, for a custom method. Okay. It can be used to make things a little bit more modular here. What I'm going to do is make a private method that is going to return a color array. And we'll call this method extract pixel data. And to this method, we'll feed a texture 2D in the form of a texture. So it looks like this is the heart of the application. Exactly. The reason I wanted to separate this method out is that way we don't have to worry about dropping in a bunch of nitty-gritty calls inside of the load content method. We separate this out into its own just, just for um, clarity's sake. Okay. So I'll leave this as a skeleton for now. I guess I could put in a return. I'm not sure if I'm going to need to build this before we actually implement it. But I'll just return um, new color array. Okay. Though I am pretty sure we're going to come back to this and simply erase that line before we use the program. All right, moving down from our newly skeleton method, the next thing we're going to take a look at is load content. And inside of load content, 
Well, in this show lies a few basic things like the font and the texture. So we can drop those in real quick here. So the font is equal to our content manager. We'll tell the content manager to load in a sprite font for us. And then the asset will be held as Tahoma. And from there, we can put in a, uh, well, we can load in our texture. Pretty much the same thing. We'll look at our content manager tool to load a type of texture 2D. And then that texture is stored in the texture subfolder as we can do ship. I'll begin with ship, and then that'll stress why the uh, ship32 is useful for Sounds the demonstration. Good. And finally, we'll set up our pixels array. We'll say that pixels will be equal to the result of extract pixel data. And to extract pixel data, we will feed our texture new texture. Over. Okay. So the next thing to do is to look at extract pixel data and provide an implementation. So back up here. The uh, first thing that we'll create in here is a, um, you can say a result temporary variable. We'll make a color array called result pixels. Really, I guess I could just, I'm going to simplify that a little bit. We'll just call that pixels. I'll differentiate using um, this.pixels versus the local variable. And then we can turn around, really, I guess I could initialize that on the same line. Pixels would be equal to a uh, new color array. Now, this color array is going to need to um, be given a size. We need to know how many pixels we're going to have. And what is the width and height of a texture in pixels? Exactly. And if you multiply the width and height of a rectangle, you get the area, or Ooh. how many pixels it contains. Exactly. So that means the number of pixels that we want is going to be based on the texture's width multiplied by the texture's height. And that was a square bracket, not a parenthesis. All right, moving down from that. Now we have created and initialized an array, but that array is all going to be whatever the default numbering is for that color, probably a color value with all components set to zero. Now we need to tell um, the texture to take all of its data that it's currently holding and dump that data into our pixels array. And this is done by using the texture2d's get data method. That can be called from an instance of texture2d. So if we say take our texture and tell it to get data, get data will take in a type and provides a few different ways that that information can be read out. Um, it takes in a type so that you can indicate to it what um, data type you're going to be storing the individual elements as. No different than when creating a list and you're specifying what kind of list, what kind of data type exactly. you're going to be working with, or right. even our load that we saw just a few minutes ago. Or more accurately, it's, uh, it uses generics. It allows right. you to specify the type that you're going to be using when you store this data. And, of course, the individual elements are going to be of type color. So that means we could fit uh, or we could fill in color for the type. And there's a few different overloads. We're going to use the most simplistic, which will return the entire texture into our array. So it's ex expecting here a uh, color array to hold the data. We have a newly created color array in the form of pixels. pixels. And with that now, we can take and return that new pixels, pixels value. Very nice. See, and you guys thought it was going to be a bit more sophisticated than that. I mean, the get data is the heart of the heart of this whole thing. Exactly. This this one line is what makes it all possible. This allows us to gain more in-depth access to a texture 2D and the information that it holds. Okay. All right. Well, moving on now, we can start taking a look at what fun things we can do with that data. So we'll turn our attention to the draw method. And instead of draw, let's set up some basic calls to the sprite batch. We'll have it begin... A little bit later, we could have it end. And before we worry about the pixel data, let's draw the graphic itself just to give a, a visual reference of what we began with. So I can take our sprite batch, tell it to draw our texture, and I'll simply feed it uh, vector2.0. We'll draw it in the top upper left-hand corner of the screen. So really, you can go ahead and build, and we can start testing this as you build up. Wow. All right, we'll just take a look at what we've got so far. And the first thing we have is an exception. I must have named that texture differently or otherwise. We shall lit. find out. Oh. <laughs> I created the texture. I pointed to the working folder. But you never actually brought it in. And I failed to perform the copy. I think I got no, sidetracked. No, you got the copy. I, you're just bringing it. 
Oh, I and, see what you're saying. Yeah. I copied and I forgot <laughs> to tell Visual Studio that I had done that. Bingo. We'll add existing items. Thunder textures. Within textures. <laughs> Here we have ship and ship 32 as content pipeline files. There we go. We'll add those, and their existence should greatly aid in our ability to run this game. <laughs> and it does. So here's what we've got. Basic uh, default screen, but we have our ship texture being drawn. Okay. So what can we do with the pixels array? Well, at this point, we want to come up with the, I guess we could call it the ASCII grid. I know it's not really ASCII internally, but our alphanumeric character set up as a grid to draw the individual pixels. But here's where an interesting consideration comes in. That pixels array, as a matter of fact, I can start a loop um, here in a second. The pixels array is a one-dimensional array of, of type color. Mm -hmm. Then when we redraw these pixels, these alphanumeric characters, we need two-dimensional information. We need to see where they exist in two dimensions. Mm -hmm. So we'll need to come up with some math to arrange them. But to begin with, I'm going to start a loop that will allow us to iterate through each individual pixel in the array. So we can do a loop and... Just for time's sake, I'll bring up the template for the for loop, and we'll loop to the end of pixels.length. All right. Now, in order to figure out where this pixel should be in 2D space is not unlike the way the animation system, the animated sprite class that we made earlier, works. That had to do much the same thing. We had a linear, you could say, line of frames mm -hmm. in a continuous sequence. And we were able to turn, take that information and turn it into positional information, providing we know the width of the texture that we're looking at. And here we do. We still have our reference to texture, so it should be very easy to look at as width. So the way I'm going to set this up is almost exactly the way I set up the uh, frame addressing in the sprite class. We'll have integers x and y, where x will be equal to the current, well, in the animation system, it was the current frame we are on. Here it is the current pixel we're on, represented by i, since i is going to represent pixels 0 through number of pixels. Right. So x will be equal to i modulus the texture's width. And then we, of course, want to have a custom size to be fed in. So I'll multiply this. We're going to begin with 16, and I'm actually going to store that variable in a val or that value in a variable to make tweaking easier. So real quickly, slight um, tangent where I'm going to change this over to an integer called block size. That just makes it so that this will be very easily adjustable. Block size. So the final formula for x is current pixel, or i, modulus texture.width times block size. Then we can gather y by doing i divided by texture.width, and again times block size. I'll simply assume that we always want to deal with these blocks as squares. And now that we have positional 2D x and y information, we can draw an alphanumeric character at the correct location. So we'll look at the sprite batch and tell it to draw a string, and Bear with me one moment because I want to uh, have that string more easily configurable just like I did the block size. I'm going to jump back up right below block size and drop in a string called, um, what do I want to call this? Draw, draw character. Sounds good. I'm going to just call it draw char. Throw a D at the beginning of that. And the char character. Char character? Do you want to call it char character or draw character? You said oh. draw. <laughs> it's like char char. Or, yeah, words are starting to get crossed in my head here. <laughs> yeah, char char. <laughs> okay. Kind of like oh, well. jar. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but all that aside, draw character will begin as the capital letter O. Okay. So then when we go to perform our draw string, we'll draw using the font that we created earlier. We'll draw the string held in draw char. The position will be a new vector 2. And we've already found x and y, so we can simply plug those values into the vector 2. Now the color. What color do we want to use to draw this character? Well, we've gone through all the effort of storing that in a nicely arranged array, so we can use pixels sub i to reference the color that we're looking for. Because mm -hmm. it's holding a color, so the data types are dead on Exactly, match. and that's another nice reason for using color itself, is now we don't have to worry about casting or building a color before we use that information. Right. So we can build, we can run, Ooh. and look at what we get. We get this very top left tip of that wing. So we've got the very edge and then a little bit of that first and second light, as we can see here 
down at the bottom. Right. This is why I prepared a 32 by 32 version of this graphic so that we can fit the entire graphic on screen while drawing it using ASCII characters. Or I keep wanting to say ASCII characters. But now, of course, scaling this down to 32 by 32 means that you, you lose a little bit, right? Right. The scale is a very quick and dirty scale down. Um, I allowed it to smooth all the edges, so some of the smoothing was done unevenly. Right. So, I mean, the resulting graphic isn't as pixel perfect as the original, but that gives us a very good opportunity to work with filtering when we try to obtain a mask from that information. So let us now change this texture to our Ship32 version of the graphic. If we rerun, now everything fits on the screen nicely. You can see the, uh, the entire ship fits as drawn by 16 by 16 character blocks. Though you will note, note towards the uh, bottom of the ship where the, uh, the fire from the engines are, that information is a little bit lopsided. But again, this is simply due to the extreme resize. Right. So cool, we've got not only color information, but we can see that we're using the alpha information as yes, well. Yes, up here at the very top of the wingtip, something that we couldn't could make even... Make a black background, maybe? Make it stand out even more? Black background will probably just make those invisible, but it would be worth looking at, just just because now I'm curious. Black would make the entire yeah, see, thing... It, actually, I think it makes it stand out a little bit more. Oh, I see. Even though it's real faint, you can you really get a feel for the transparency. And let's look at the fire now. So with the fire, I know that you guys should be able to see the cursor over this. So I will assume right about here you should be able to see the cursor. We can't, of course. So somewhere right in this area, the fire, you can see it's, um, as get, Logan was saying, very lopsided. What did you say? I guess I could enable display of the mouse if we wanted to be able to point so at So we things. can point. Yeah, that's if true. I remember, I'll do but, that before the next build. But anyway, so you can see, though, we, we can see what's transparent. We can see how much it's transparent, what's nice and opaque. Uh, very, very cool. But the big thing is, is we can verify that we have indeed sampled or extracted all of the pixel data that was in that small graphic that Logan loaded in. Exactly, and now we have access to the individual red RGB and alpha information. Just as a quick uh, hint before we get into that, we could look at the individual pixel. There's our alpha, our blue, our green, and our red components. Fantastic. Now, before I get into that, there is a different character that makes this a little bit easier to look at and allows you to fit more pixels on the screen. If I bring up a character map and I switch over to the Tahoma font so we have an accurate representation of what the characters available are, we scroll way down near the bottom, we have this area of um, shapes, and one of the shapes is this black circle, and that would be much nicer for representing a uniform pixel. Mm -hmm. So what I want to do is remember this value, um, Unicode uh, or hex value 25CF. Okay. Now we can, we can use that easily enough here by changing the draw character to casted result to char of the value 0 by... 25 CF. Though thinking about this, this is a character, which means we need to change the uh, draw itself. You can't assign a character directly to a string. That should explode nicely. We can, however, make a call to the strings constructor. If we make a new string, one of the things that we can feed in is a character and then a number of characters to repeat, which means if we fed in a character and told it to repeat once, now we have a string made from this character. So we should be able to build and everything work fine. If we run the application should explode because that character is not part of or is not available inside the uh, the sprite sheet. What that means is if we load up the sprite font itself and scroll to the very bottom, we have a character region set up, which makes sense because you don't want thousands and thousands of characters making an insanely huge texture. That's right. But we do want to add to this character region so that it includes the dot that we're trying to draw. So what I'll do is I'll copy and paste that region and change it to only represent the character that we want. Though these values are in decimal, not in hex. So we'll need to bring up a trusty calculator in order to convert it over. I believe the value was 25 CF. Mm -hmm. And actually we need to be in hex to do this. 25 CF converted to decimal is a decimal value of 9679. We'll copy that value, close the calculator, and we can plug that into our character map or our uh, character region, and run the game. And now we're drawing using dots. Very nice. The dots are physically smaller than the letter O, so I'm actually going to change our block size down somewhat to make better use of the screen space. Cool. And so now we have our ship drawn using dots, a little bit easier on the eyes. It makes sense for pixel data. And for anyone that may have been just a bit confused about the character region stuff, remember we have covered that in detail in the past. Right, so you can always refer back to that to get a more in-depth explanation of what we're doing with those character regions. Right. 
All right, looking good. So, we, so what can we do with this now? We have all of this data, all this color information, alpha information. Well, the goal here is to decide for each pixel within this texture, should that pixel be considered for a collision? Okay. Or should it be ignored? Go ahead. Can you enable the mouse for me real quick? Sure, sure. And one moment, we'll go to the constructor. We'll take a look at the is mouse visible. <laughs> and we'll do more than look at it. We'll actually indeed set this. I think that was awesome, actually. And now we have a mouse that we can see. Of course, you can see before just on the recording, but now this allows us to see what you're seeing. Exactly. So, all right, we see these pixels right here. Right next to these pixels, there's a very faint trail of pixels. And depending on how the compression, you know, how, how this color data holds up in the compression of this video to XVID, right. that might not even be visible to you guys. Now, the question is, would we want a collision to occur if an object was to collide with these pixels? It might look like there's a small gap in there when you're playing the game. Exactly. So we need to look at these pixels, consider their alpha, and decide if it should be included for a visual collision or not. Because we now have the ability to quickly mask out things like this. But yeah, let's, let's take a look at some of the things you can show. Like you can show everything that's transparent, everything that's opaque, everything that's opaque of a certain amount, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Exactly. So let's do just that. <laughs> opaque of a certain amount. Let's say transparent a certain amount. Ah, that's better. So what if we were to go back to our draw method, and before we perform a draw, what if we check the alpha value of the current pixel? So if we look at pixel sub i, and look at its value or alpha value. Mm -hmm. And let's say we only draw if that alpha value is equal to a value of zero. That would mean that if that pixel was completely transparent. Right. Now, of course, the transparent pixel is going to be invisible, so I'm going to change the actual drawn color of the dot here to yellow, just to make it very obvious what we're drawing. Otherwise, we wouldn't see it because it's invisible. <laughs> because, exactly. <laughs> So this result would give us all pixels that are invisible, and we see a cutout mask of our ship. And it makes complete sense, too. I mean, because, well, the ship exists in here, and all of this is transparent. And if we had an object sliding into here, we would not want a collision to occur here. We'd want the collision to occur when we hit the ship. So really, we would want to look at the opposite pixels. We would want to look at the pixels that are filled in, so we could change the if statement to be not transparent or not zero. And now we have a mask that represents what should be the solid pixels, though it doesn't accurately represent that. Well, it looks kind of noisy. Exactly. <laughs> you can see that the resize was, in fact, very dirty on this because you see the solid lines of the wing of the ship and then some space and then pixels reappear outside of it. And what's really cool is that very faint line I showed you guys just a second ago was this line right here. We couldn't even see that. Exactly. <laughs> but yeah, just to point out what you had said earlier, you were looking at a visual, when you just looked at the color values, it looked like a one pixel wide line, because unless the compression holds up very well, you won't even be able to see the pixels that were to the right. Looking at the alpha, we can see that there was a two pixel line all the way down. Yeah. So first we need to clean this up and then maybe even consider how tight these uh, collisions are down here. So how do we start filtering things? Well, we could change this instead of doing an directly equal to check. We could actually put a range on this. We could say that if the alpha was greater, great enough, if it was strong enough, then and only then would we consider that pixel solid. So let's start trying some values, like maybe a value of 10. Much better for the noise all Absolutely. the way around, but it's still leaving these trails down here very thick. And we might want to strip these ones off the side if, the, uh, if that was causing collision problems, mm -hmm. or if we, we simply didn't want a visual collision on a faint pixel. So let's start cranking this up, maybe a value of 50. You know, there that you might actually work. Um, we're getting a few pixels chipped out up at the top. I wonder if those could be brought back without completely removing them or completely adding the ones on the bottom. Look at that. Oh, well, yeah, that's pretty darn close. Maybe try 40. No kind of compromise. Ooh, very nice. Single. I have a few off to the side, but single all the way across mm -hmm. up until the very end. In one pixel on the side. Now, you probably don't have to be this picky about what pixels are. Try 45. Collide. i got to see 45. All right. We'll try 45. Let's cut it down some more. Yeah. 48. Yeah, I like that. These, 48, 48 will do the trick. Yeah, the, that works. The top wing pieces are even. The bottom wing pieces are yeah, even. It's, it and looks, it's one pixel per. Yeah, it looks even all the way around. Now, and like I was saying, again, you probably don't have to be that picky about the individual pixels because look, look how small we're the graphic is. Look at this is. tiny graphic, so no one's really going to notice if you hit one pixel to the left or right of that little. That's right. Outcropping. Of course, if everything was scaled up, 
then it would become a little bit more noticeable. Exactly. If you're doing a retro mode or if you had like right. large pixel 320 by 240 mode, <laughs> exactly. then it would become very important. It all depends on the – I guess really it all depends on the draw style of your game. Right. But that's awesome that you have this ability now. But it, it, it is very awesome that we have that level of control. And really it's not – the filter itself isn't very expensive. It's just to check against another integer to see mm-hmm. what the value is. And with that, we were able to filter out all the colors that we didn't want included for the collision. Exactly. So is there anything else you wanted to show? Is that pretty much it here? I think that's all I wanted to show in this demonstration. Again, just proving the fact that we can extract the data from a texture 2D data type, look at that data pixel by pixel, even knowing where it exists on screen if we wanted to, Mm -hmm. and look at the data within it to decide if the pixel should be considered for a collision. What we had did or what we had done was drawn a mask out of individual dots using the color yellow and applied filtering so that we could decide whether or not each individual pixel should be included for a collision. Exactly. For a collision, uh, what's what I'm looking for? Detection. Detection? No, um, decision. Um, if, if we're going to use it or not to, to decide if there's been a collision. There we go. <laughs> Anyways, yeah, this is uh, this once again is the first in a few videos as we're going to build up the uh, the whole collision detection idea. I think in the next video we're going to well, we're going to take it a lot further. So um, with that, again, again, this is obviously very important in what we're doing. But with that, that is going to wrap up this video. Thanks a lot.